Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Ideas for Tomorrow. Welcome to Virtual Ideas for Tomorrow. Our guest today has played a commanding role in broadcast journalism. She's worked for every major network and traveled around the world to report the news. As a woman journalist, she has broken barriers and pioneered new media. In 2000, her courageous campaign to raise awareness of colon cancer made history. Katie Couric is known and loved by millions. Now she's working on her memoir, and here's a video to tell you more. Witnessing history, capturing a moment, documenting life as it happens. Reporting is anything but a job to journalist Katie Couric. Using her natural curiosity about people and events, she seeks the truth, challenges the status quo, and gives a voice to those needing to be heard. Becoming a reporter seemed like destiny for Katie Couric. Her father, a writer and a journalist, noticed her investigative spirit and encouraged her to follow her instincts. She decided to pursue a career in broadcasting after graduating from the University of Virginia in 1979. Working as a general assignment reporter in Miami, then Washington, D.C., network executives began to take notice. Couric joined NBC News in 1989 as deputy Pentagon correspondent. After serving as a substitute during the morning show, she was named permanent co-anchor in 1991. From celebrities to top newsmakers, her hard-hitting interview style accompanied by her friendly demeanor helped drive high ratings, making today the most watched morning show in the country. After 15 years, she decided to make a change and make history. This is the CBS Evening News with Katie Couric. In 2006, Couric became the first woman at the helm of an evening national newscast. Five years later, she left CBS and became a special correspondent for ABC News. While in that position, she also hosted Katie, a nationally syndicated daytime talk show. She then became global anchor for the internet-based Yahoo in 2014. I think Katie has longevity in the industry because Katie is multi-talented. She turned those talents into a multimedia empire, launching her production company, Katie Couric Media, in 2015. But we're developing and creating all kinds of content. She is actively involved in producing content for digital media, documentaries, and podcast conversations. Katie Couric's accomplishments have garnered many awards throughout her career. She has earned a DuPont Columbia, Peabody, two Edward R. Murrow Awards, a Walter Cronkite Award from the well, University of Southern video, California's Annenberg back. School, and multiple Emmys. Reaching the audience became personal to Katie after the death of her husband. Turning her family tragedy into awareness, she televised her colonoscopy. Researchers then documented a near 20% increase in the number of people undergoing the procedure, dubbing it the Couric Effect. Katie Couric is a co-founder of Stand Up to Cancer, raising money to accelerate innovative cancer research to get the video. new therapies to patients quickly and save lives. Journalist, cancer advocate, author, and documentary filmmaker, Katie Couric tackles each role with tenacity, confidence, and compassion. In countless ways, in video. she continues to set the narrative for change and inspires millions along the way. To... It is a pleasure to have you here, Katie. Thank Welcome. you, Dr. Mihalovich. It's great to be here. Well, we are absolutely delighted that you have participated on our virtual ideas for tomorrow. And uh, I would like to really start our conversation by asking you, about your career. Uh, you have an unmatched career, one of the most successful admired journalists on broadcast television, and you have gone out on your own now, now to, to become, become an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur. So, so can you please tell us a little bit about your decision to start your own company, Katie Couric Media? Sure. Well, first of all, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. This is usually not virtual. It's usually in person, right? Yes, correct. Yes. We love having people here in Cleveland to have them here in, in, in person and to welcome them to Cleveland Clinic. But, you know, the, the times have changed. So Yes. 
desperate times call for desperate measures, and I'm so happy to be here virtually, but I hope you'll invite me back to Cleveland sometime to, to be there in person. Um, basically, you know, as you saw in that tape, uh, thank you, by the way, whoever put that together, I have done a lot of things in my career, and I think the one thing I hadn't done was being an entrepreneur. And I think given all my experience in journalism, in broadcast journalism primarily, I witnessed an evolution and a, a dramatic shift in the media landscape happening about probably five to 10 years ago. And what happened was disintermediation, which means you can talk directly to consumers. Uh, there are fewer gatekeepers. You'll, you've seen during the pandemic that pretty much everybody is a talk show host now and doing interviews and talking to people about various topics. That mass media was becoming increasingly an oxymoron. People were getting their news from particular sources. The number of sources were multiplying. And I thought, you know, it would be really exciting to start a company to give opportunities to young journalists um, and to try to take advantage of this new landscape. So I have a diversified media portfolio at, at Katie Kirk Media. I didn't want to call it that, but everyone said you should because your name is recognizable. But we have a, a daily newsletter which synthesizes and, and, and basically collates the news of the day and, and really kind of we, we uh, you know, do these summaries. We have links to great publications, the articles, the information we think people need to have to start their day. Um, we also, I'm also doing a podcast, two podcasts, one called Next Question, where I connect the dots on big issues like vaping. How did that happen? Yeah. Or what exactly is CBD? Does it work? And why isn't it better regulated, et cetera? Uh, to name a few, I might do something on white supremacy too. So there, it's a variety of things, not, not simply medical issues, even though I'm very interested in, in science and medicine. So I also have a podcast called Back to Biz with uh, a friend of mine who's the CMO of Endeavor. She's a, a very experienced person in marketing and she also happens to be black. And I wanted to team up with her to, to have my voice joined by someone who's had a different life experience than I have to talk to leaders, thought leaders and executives about the path forward now that we've been dealing with this pandemic. So I interviewed Mary, Bose and I interviewed Mary Barra yesterday, the, the uh, CEO of GM, one of the few CEOs of a Fortune 500 company. I believe there are only 37 females, one of the few female CEOs. We interviewed TD Jakes, uh, a bishop, in Texas, as well as Opal Tometi, who started the Black Lives Matter, to talk about this moment in time and what we're witnessing, experiencing, et cetera. So I've got the podcast, I've got the newsletter. Um, I'm also doing video content for purpose-driven brands. So let's say Procter & Gamble cares deeply about gender equality. And I might be doing a series for them on that. We do a, a series called See Her Stories, where we celebrate women in history who have often been overlooked. So as you can imagine, I'm busy and I am writing my memoir, as you mentioned, but I wanted to take advantage and to, to marshal this new kind of way to communicate with people. And to be honest with you, it's much more of a two-way situation to be able to get feedback from consumers right away. Some of them are trolls, but most of them are really, really smart, thoughtful people. It, it, it's really helped me build a community, particularly on Instagram, where I talk about ideas. I try to provide a platform to people for people to give feedback. And I sometimes miss being at a big network and having, uh, you know, the whole feeling of, of, of teamwork of a huge organization. But this has given me a lot more flexibility. I even executive produced a, a show on Netflix called Unbelievable based on an article I had read written by ProPublica and the Marshall Project. And it just won a Peabody. So I feel oh, like I can kind of have my fingers in a lot of pies 
help build up a lot of young journalists and, um, you know, kind of, kind of meet people where they are. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, you know, because when you reflect on your own career, I'm, I'm wondering, how do you advise new journalists in this yeah. new, new era of journalism? How should they approach their careers? Because the world has changed. As it has. you nicely, nicely described, now we have many more media outlets. We have a completely new forums. Uh, the, the pace of the news has yes. increased tremendously. And so has the quality has changed as well. So yeah. wh what is your advice to young people who would like to become Katie Kirk of tomorrow? <laughs> I'm not sure there are going to be any, uh, you know, because it is so fragmented. And, okay. um, but I, I still think it's a wonderful profession. One of my daughters has followed in my footsteps. She's in print. She works for Reuters. Um, I would say some of the skills that you need to be really good at your job are, are actually uniform across the board, even in a changing landscape. So I would say write as much as you can, build up your social media platform. You know, Glennon Doyle started, she's a, a you know, New York Times bestselling author, and she started just writing things and sending them to her friends. So I think you have to keep an eye out on how the, the, the medium is changing but maybe you want to work in podcasts. Maybe you, you're in, really interested in cooking, for example. You could be, there's cooking journalism going on right now. There's environmental journalism, medical journalism. You know, I was a generalist. Uh, so I was sort of five miles wide and two inches deep. <laughs> you know, I had to know a little about a lot of things. What helped me is I'm good at kind of synthesizing and translating complicated concepts uh, because I've had to learn so quickly and then help other people understand. But I think sometimes if you have a specialty, if you're really interested in a certain area, um, if you, you know, a friend of mine started a whole newsletter about Silicon Valley and technology. So I think, you know, I would tell young journalists the same thing. What are they passionate about? What are they, what are they really interested in? Are they interested in social justice? Then learn more about that, write about that. Um, go to publications that are focused on that because it is a different path. But the good news is there are so many outlets now that um, I think it's 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 easier probably to to find what you're passionate about and then to rise through the ranks because it's less sort of big big companies that are that are running the whole show. There's just a little more upward mobility, I think. But who knows, yeah. because the economic climate is so uncertain right now. Um, I think media companies like everyone else, I think, you know, they're dealing with a harsh new reality that hopefully will, will uh, remedy itself in the future. Well, I, I think you're very modest and you said that you're a generalist and you have a very many diverse this interests. This is diet ginger ale, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want people to think it's like Cuddy Sark or something. It's diet ginger ale. <laughs> I have, I have no doubts, <laughs> but one thing that you are so passionate about and you developed something, a passion through personal tragedy, uh, a passion about healthcare and scientific research, particularly uh, surrounding cancer. So I, I was wondering if you can share with us a little bit about your personal connection to this work and what have you been able to accomplish so far? Because I find that uh, story very, very intriguing uh, and it is obviously a personal one. Well, you know, when I started on the Today Show, um, I would often be asked to MC various events, you know, for all incredibly important, worthy causes. And I cared about all of them. I cared about childhood hunger. I cared about poverty. I cared about, you know, gosh, Alzheimer's, ALS. You know, everyone, um, I think, is sincerely committed to... Uh, various causes, but I think I found my calling because sadly my calling found me when my husband was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer in 1997. He was just 41 years old. Uh, there was no history of colon cancer in his family, although his mom died of ovarian cancer and his grandmother had breast cancer. And there may be a connection, as you know, with yeah. those cancers. Um, 
And it was so traumatizing, as you can imagine. I, we had two little girls uh, who were one and five when he got sick and six and two, nine months later when he died. And I realized that I had an opportunity to educate the public about this number two cancer killer of men and women combined. But it was also a time when people didn't feel comfortable talking about colons, like Ugh, colons, rectums, bowels, anuses. You know, it's just like anal cancer. Like who wants to talk about that? It was very much where breast cancer was many years ago. And the emperor of all maladies, Sid Siddhartha Mukherjee writes about a classified ad taking out, taken out in the New York Times for a cancer support group for women who are experiencing cancer of the chest cavity because they couldn't say breast in the New York Times. So I felt like colon cancer needed to come out of the closet, if you will. And I felt that the, the population, that viewers of the Today Show and everyone who would listen to me needed to understand how preventable it was, that it has a 92% cure rate if it's detected early. And no family history, as we tragically discovered, is no guarantee. So I really just... Um, devoted and put my heart and soul into colon cancer awareness because I had this built-in bully pulpit of the Today Show, an audience of several million people, and I knew I had the potential to save many lives. And so that's what really drove me to colon cancer and the on-air colonoscopy, which, you know, I didn't do for ratings. I mean, let's face it, who wants to watch that in the morning? But I tried to make it informative. I tried to remove the stigma associated with colon cancer screening and um, demystify the procedure. And as you saw, it was very effective. Um, and I think because people knew I had this personal story, it was even more motivating for them. And after that, I started uh, with a, uh, nine other type A women stand up to cancer because I, I discovered that that cancer scientists just weren't collaborative enough. They were competitive, understandably. They were proprietary about their research. They you know, competed for funding for research. And we thought, isn't there a way where we could get these medical institutions, where we could get these biotech firms, where we could get all sorts of scientists to team up into dream teams, to share their research to share ideas and tissue samples and clinical trials and just collaborate so we could move the ball forward faster. And we gave them a strict timeline uh, of three years from research to clinical trials. Phil Sharp, who uh, is the Nobel laureate from MIT, became head of our scientific advisory board. Um, and, you know, and, and then with the help of the Entertainment Industry Foundation, we got a lot of celebrities and every other year we did a telethon and these celebrities of course i think you know the Couric effect kind of showed that if you have a public face on an issue it can be much more effective so we've raised i think 630 million dollars in the past 12 years we give these research uh, dollars to the scientific dream teams our scientists have contributed to six new FDA approved drugs. Most of our work is focused on immunotherapy, but we're working like with nanotechnology, epigenetics, all kinds of things. Um, and it's really, really exciting. And, you know, I, I have a group of extraordinary women who are just so committed to keeping this thing going. And when I walk into that studio, when we do our telecast, and I just see what nine, nine crazy or 10 crazy women have created um, out of nothing. It's so gratifying and inspiring. And, you know, I always say, I don't, you know, the first, I hope the first paragraph of my obituary, if I, if I get one without paying for it, maybe I'll have to pay for it in the New York Times, but I hope my cancer advocacy will be front and center because it's been so important for me, uh, for, for, for me to heal and for me to really 
commit myself to something that's bigger than my, myself. And I remember Ellie, who's now 28, when she was in fourth grade, she said in the kitchen, just out of the blue, mom, I'm so proud of the work you've done with colon cancer. So I think it was a great uh, object lesson for my daughters as well. And hopefully, you know, when they're faced with some challenges and disappointments and setbacks and heartbreaks, they'll find it in themselves to dig deep and move forward and, and do something positive with, with whatever's happened. Well, you have certainly done a lot and thank you very much on behalf of countless patients and our entire profession because your efforts were truly, truly trans transformative in, in its nature. I mean, to create such a phenomenal awareness about the importance of early screening for an outcomes of colon cancer and cancer in general has been very, very impactful. But there is something uh, about a cancer's health equity initiative uh, that you are supporting uh, that is very topical. It is very timely yes. today uh, when it comes uh, to addressing racial disparities. Uh, when it comes to treatments of cancer participation and trial. Would you mind speaking a little bit about this? Sure. You know, um, it's interesting because we established this at the beginning of the year. And I know that all the smart people watching have seen the disproportionate number of people with color who have been affected by COVID-19. Um, I think it has laid bare these inequities that exist, these economic, social, medical inequities that are really just unacceptable. You know, uh, that, that essential workers are pr primarily people of color, so they were more exposed for those reasons. Uh, people in, in poor housing conditions, uh, obviously they were more vulnerable to this disease. And, you know, I, uh, people who don't have access to healthcare, who had underlying conditions that might have been uh, ameliorated or mitigated if they had had more access to health care, you know, so it's just this kind of cascading uh, process that made people so vulnerable to this disease. And I think it opened everyone's eyes to the fact that our health care system is just failing too many people. And, and uh, the, the health equity initiative that Stand Up to Cancer launched in January is really to try to get more people of color in clinical trials. You know, clinical trials are woefully under, uh, under, I guess, understaffed. I don't know if that's what you would call it, but not enough people participate in clinical trials. I'm sure everyone, many people watching this are well aware of that. And the representation for minorities is even worse because only 4% of clinical trial participants are black, 4% Hispanic, and 15% Asian. Now, that's the percentage of a small percentage of people overall who are participating in clinical trials. And so the Health Equity Initiative is really designed to encourage, to do more outreach to, to people in the minority community, to get them more involved. Because if we don't understand how certain treatments and therapies are working on patients across the board, of all races and nationalities and, and, and situations and biologies, we're really doing a disservice. It reminds me of the women's health study, you know, the, the, that when heart disease, I think before Bernadine Healy, I believe, um, you know, was only studied on men. And it's like, what the hell people, how can you figure out what impact heart disease has on women or who's at high risk? If you're only studying men, it just doesn't make sense. So like everything in the world that I think we've, we've come to realize in a kind of head spinning way, um, we need to make clinical trials more inclusive and medicine in general more inclusive. And you know, I told you guys, I told Dr. Mihalovich that I was going to uh, ask him uh, as some questions too. So I'm gonna turn the tables for a minute because I can't help myself because I wondered about how the Cleveland Clinic is dealing with this moment in time. You know, I think it's a, it's, it's a reckoning for so many people. And I wanted to know how you all are, are thinking about things, are, are thinking about, um, you know, how to make 
things more equitable? What kind of conversations are you having with your teams? And um, how do you think that people in medicine, for example, can represent a more diverse population? Well, Cleveland Clinic uh, has now for quite a few years recognized the importance of our stronger presence in the community. So we were moving away from uh, being just recognized for excellence in episodes of care, performing a surgery or performing a procedure. And have started to focus more and more about being an active partner in the health of our broader communities. So over the past 10 years, we have increased the number of our primary care and family care physicians immensely and have uh, founded the largest institute at the Cleveland Clinic, which is now Cleveland Clinic Community Care, uh, which essentially addresses the very issues that you have just highlighted. We're very much aware of the fact that the health of the country, the health of the nations, and the health of the individuals is only to a smaller part determined by the quality of the hospital care. It is to a larger, largest possible part determined by an ability to access care and by what we call a social determinants of health, mm -hmm. meaning appropriate housing, employment, education, access to food, you know, just to name a few. So uh, we, along with very many healthcare organizations in the United States, have really shifted, made a, made a major shift to address those disparities. And we're certainly far away from where we want to be, but we are well along the way to get there. And this tragic and a sad pandemic that has hit the entire world has uh, unfortunately confirmed the hypothesis. And the hypothesis is that the social determinants of health are really a paramount uh, factor in, uh, in making a difference between the, the health and the disease and the life and death for, for so many. Can you tell me any, can you give me any concrete examples of what you're doing? And if in fact, you said you have a, a long way to go, but I'm just curious, um, are there particular initiatives that you've seen have a real impact on improving outcomes or reducing some of these comorbidities that we saw so frequently in these cases of COVID-19? Yeah, the, the, most, the most important initiative is to, uh, to improve access. In the absence of access to healthcare, you know, we cannot even start to have a dialogue. And what we have done is we have developed a network of primary care, and family care physicians that really goes deep into communities. And we have started more and more, not just waiting for the patients to come to us for care, but really coming into their homes and uh, into their communities and uh, be much more proactive in offering a helping hand when they need it. And we have been much more proactive in actually following up our patients with chronic conditions. Mm -hmm. The follow-up for the conditions, you know, that that require continuity of care has been really important for us. The biggest determinant for Cleveland Clinic strategy for the future, and I believe the major determinant of success for the health of the United States or our world in general is to provide a continuity access and a continuity of care. So we have to move away from the mindset that, uh, that a health care is just an episode of care that gets provided when people become ill. We have to become partners to our patients in their wellness efforts. We have to keep them healthy uh, and instead of just being there for them when they become ill. Yeah, that's so critically important. And yet it's sort of hard to convince people, both consumers and insurance companies, um, how critically important it is to, just as I believe in can colon cancer screening or other methods to detect colon cancer at, at its earlier stage or earliest possible stage, that, that you have to try to keep people healthy. And it saves so much money in the long run. And I would think that maybe with telemedicine and uh, that was sort of revved up so, uh, accelerated so much during this crisis, that that might be a helpful tool in some underserved communities. Oh, absolutely. Telemedicine has uh, exploded, for lack of a better term, uh, during the COVID pandemic. 
Uh, we at the Cleveland Clinic used to do approximately 5,000 telemedicine visits a month uh, before the pandemic. During the pandemic, that number rose to 200,000 telemedicine visits a month. But what is really important when it comes to our underserved community, we have to understand that a prerequisite for having a successful and impactful rollout of telemedicine is actually have an ability to have a, a good Wi-Fi connection. Right. Oh, no, that's true. And that <laughs> that is so important because the digital divide, I don't know if everybody's watching, saw, you know, when it came to homework, kids in rural areas would have to drive to parking lots or come to offices and do their homework with their families and their cars. And that is such a critically important thing that you pointed out. And I hope, you know, it's almost like the pandemic has exposed these these simmering social ills that have been on the verge of exploding. And in the case of, I think, uh, race has exploded, although that's, that's kind of, I think the pandemic provided the backdrop and, and, and the murder of, of George Floyd was the match that ignited this movement. But, you know, um, I think that Whoever's president or, you know, our leaders, and in, in, in some cases, I think the governors have been really impressive, and I think governors are getting newfound respect in the midst of this crisis, but they're going to, I think, have very clearly some huge priorities in addition to the pandemic and the economy, and obviously, you know, this, this movement uh, that we've seen unleashed in this country um, but they're going to have to to deal with, uh, I think, multiple social issues, and they're going to have a lot on their plate. But in a way, I think it's such an opportunity to address some of these issues, and it's a really exciting time. And we can no longer brush them under the rug. We have to kind of, you know, really put our collective heads together and start tackling some of these big issues. Or I think America is going to have, you know, it's 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 the the social fabric of this country is already, uh, you know, has been frayed, and we really need some. We all have some serious work to do at every level. I think. I be, I believe so, and I would like to say, however, that the pandemic has also exposed uh, probably a welcome necessity that I think now everyone realizes that we cannot cure the America of pandemic until every American is cured of COVID. There is an inter-reliance, there is, there is a, a clear understanding that in order for us all to get out of this vicious circle of, of pandemic, we have to really protect our, our community. And uh, uh, the poorest parts of our community are struck at the hardest. Those are the ones they do not have an access to Wi-Fi. They do not have an ac good access to telemedicine. Their children need the same access to, to do their, their schoolwork. So uh, this is a compound in a, and a sad effect of pandemic that we have to address. We are here at the Cleveland Clinic, for example, have uh, from the roof of our main campus have amplified a Wi-Fi signal for our neighborhood so that we can oh. provide both the, both the access to healthcare and telemedicine, but also the platform for our youngest neighbors to be able to do their homework at home. That's awesome. And we should also mention, you know, it's been actually very gratifying for me because for me, people in the medical field like you and probably many people listening have always been my personal heroes, cancer scientists and clinicians, but all kinds of doctors and nurses, God bless all you nurses and all the medical people who make a hospital and or you know, doctor's office run uh, effectively. I think the nation suddenly realized that how grateful they are and how selfless people are who choose to go into this line of work. And they marveled at the teamwork uh, that they saw with all these doctors from all different disciplines uh, and specialists coming together to really uh, tackle this crisis, which it was. And I think that it was just so inspiring for me to witness and to see in New York, everyone lean out their windows and applaud at 7 a.m. I think there was a new recognition and an appreciation for people in the healthcare industry. So for all of you out there who are watching this 
If you're even still with us, thank you for everything you do every day, but especially, especially in the last few months, we're, we are eternally grateful for your service. Well, thank you very much. And we're here at the clinic, we're blessed to have wonderful, wonderful and very dedicated caregivers who have uh, been put in an immense amount of effort, but also compassion every day for every yeah. patient that we serve. And it's, you know, it's quite traumatizing. One of the things that I was interested in, I teamed up with Time Magazine to do these profiles of caregivers. I talked to a chaplain from Mount Sinai. I talked to a nurse from New York Hospital. I talked to many people from NYU, Mark Pachapin, who ran the Monaghan Center, which we started after Jay died, to provide comprehensive holistic care for, for people who with all kinds of gastrointestinal cancers. Um, you know, it, it was just, it was so incredible to to celebrate them and to support them. But I wonder, and I hope that you're thinking about this at the Cleveland Clinic, not that I'm telling you how to do your job, but you know, it's, it must be quite traumatizing for a lot of medical professionals to have witnessed. I don't know how many COVID cases you all had at the Cleveland Clinic, but as you know, in New York City, some of these hospitals were absolutely overrun with these, and it, you know, doctors and nurses, they want to be compassionate and they couldn't even touch people and they couldn't even really be with people. And this chaplain, it was just so heartbreaking. And her, her interview was so beautiful. I urge you guys to follow me on Instagram and check out some of these profiles. But I worry about sort of the psychological impact on the healthcare providers. So I really, really hope, I know that they're trained to do that and probably didn't want to slow down to even think about it, but I hope that, that they'll get the mental health support that they need. Um, and I think that mental health has come to the forefront during this pandemic too, because everybody, everyone's been grappling with it. And that's something I'm very interested in, helping people be less uh, reticent about talking about depression and anxiety and all kinds of things that have really surfaced because of this pandemic and also with this you know aforementioned reckoning that we're dealing with in our country about about race and equality and opportunity yeah, I, I couldn't agree more i mean the toll on our caregivers has been exceptional we're very fortunate here at the cleveland clinic both in cleveland uh, here in the uh, home state of ohio and florida that we have not had such a huge wave of COVID patients as uh, our colleagues in New York City experienced. But uh, we did uh, our best to try to help. We had uh, a contingency of volunteer caregivers who spent a month in New York City and New York Presbyterian. And Thank then we had, an <laughs> no, you're welcome. And then we had another group who went, who went to Michigan, to, De to Detroit, to right. uh, Henry Ford Hospital to help our colleagues over there because we just thought that it was our duty to band together and lend a helping hand. And now can we I have- one of, Can I ask you one other question sure. about, about the pandemic? Uh, do you sure. think there's gonna be a second spike? And, and what do you think is, can you give us an update on what you know about the vaccine? Yeah. I certainly hope that there is not going to be a second spike. And uh, if it occurs, I hope it's going to be more of a, wave and not a big one, but a, but a swell rather than a, a second spike. The reason for my optimism personally is be, uh, because I do believe that we have learned how to deal with the disease. We have learned about the importance of social distancing, mask wearing, and also protection of those who are the most vulnerable. And I do believe that those lessons uh, we will have to be able to carry over the next few months as the flu season starts so that we can protect the most vulnerable people in our communities. Vaccine is uh, uh, a remarkable story. Uh, COVID-19 vaccine, as you know well, is uh, under development by very many companies. There are very many candidates for a vaccine. And speaking about a collaboration that you in your efforts when it comes to uh, colon cancer recognized as essential for advancement of science. Right. There has never been more collaboration in the medical community uh, than we're seeing today with COVID-19. So I am optimistic that we are going to have a vaccine, but I would like to stress that there is absolutely no guarantee that it will have one. 
Uh, coronaviruses have been around for a long time. We've been exposed to them for a long time. And uh, development of a vaccine is not a trivial matter. We still have very many viral diseases, let's just mention HIV or hepatitis C, that have been around for a really, really long time, and we still do not have a vaccine. So I'm certainly very hopeful that we're going to have a vaccine. If we do, it is going to be at the earliest uh, next year, mm -hmm. uh, second, third, second quarter of next year before we can really see a product that uh, we as a medical community will feel safe to, to share with the broader population. There's a good reason why vaccine development takes time. Well, I, that's exciting. And what about therapies? Do you think that there may be you know, effective therapies? Well, we are finding several drugs that uh, can attenuate, not cure the disease, but attenuate the course of disease and make it, make it less severe. And there are a number of, the, of known drugs that we are currently using to treat patients uh, uh, with uh, COVID-19 infections from Desivir is the one that is, uh, right. uh, uh, that is known so well and that is currently being distributed to many patients, including uh, very many of our patients at Cleveland Clinic. And it is showing good results. Convalescent plasma holds some promise for those with a severe form of illness. But once again, development of those drugs takes time, and uh, uh, it is difficult to accelerate it. There are certain steps, as you well know, in development of new drugs that we have to respect and follow because we do not want to inflict more harm to those who are already vulnerable. I think it was so interesting how the medical professionals had to, they, how, how stressful it was because they had to learn in real time, you know, how to you know, treat these patients. And, uh, you know, I think it was a real wake up call because clearly we were not as prepared as we should have been. Um, I did a podcast about that. And hopefully moving forward, there will be a lot of lessons learned. Uh, but some things, you know, you can't control. And that was this virus was so, um, I think, uh, confounding for so many people. And, uh, it's just been, it's been a very, very interesting thing and heartbreaking, of course, for so many families uh, who lost loved ones and my heart goes out to them as well. But, you know, keep on keeping on. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, I, I, I think you said it very nicely. And I think we, uh, both of our professions, uh, uh, both journalists and healthcare providers now really have to band together to disseminate the right information, educate right. the public. Now more than ever, because yeah. of so much misinformation, uh, yeah. it's, it's a very challenging time for my profession be, and because of the, you know, the, the, the veritable tsunami of information that you're accosted by almost on a minute by minute basis. You talk about the news cycle being so fast and furious and then trying to separate fact from fiction, people, you know, the, the downside of the democratiz, uh, the good side of the democratization of media is everyone has a voice. The, yes. the bad side of the democratization of media is that everybody has a voice. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> it's, it's quite difficult. And those gatekeepers and governors and editors and people who are vetting information and content when it was such a, you know, uh, when there was, three networks and, and big metropolitan newspapers, um, the, the way that information was, uh, you know, critically considered and edited and, you know, labored over, um, you know, with, with a huge amount of integrity and intention and effort, you know, that was a much easier time. And even then people got it wrong, but at least, yeah. um, you know, you knew that, that what you were reading was pretty accurate. Now, many times it's engagement through enragement and affirmation, not information. And so it's a challenging time in, in journalism, I think. Oh, I think it is a challenging time, but I'm, I, I'm always hopeful for a silver lining and I know that you're an optimist and we're gonna find our way out of this for sure. And I can uh, I thank you very much for the discussion, but I would like to ask, uh, actually, uh, give an opportunity to our audience to ask oh, some sure. questions. Oh, sure. I know. I'm sorry. That's okay I with you. Much. 
No, 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 no worries. So these questions were submitted uh, before today's discussion. So I'll, I'll start with the first uh, with the first question. Um, our viewers are wondering: Is there someone that Katie Couric never interviewed, and it is high on your list of people that you would love to interview? Ah, uh, I thought about this, and I'm trying to remember. Um, Colin Kaepernick, I would really love to talk to Colin Kaepernick right now because okay. he started such a movement. Um, I would like to, I always wanted to interview Princess Diana. <laughs> I always wanted to interview Jacqueline Kennedy uh, to hear from her. Um, I've always wanted to interview Angela Merkel, but I don't speak German and she doesn't speak English. So that might be difficult, but there are ways around that. Um, you know, I, I didn't get a chance for all this to interview Anthony Fauci. So if you guys can put a good word in for me, he kind of blew me off, but that's okay, Dr. Fauci. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm interested in, in almost everything. And I feel like everyone has something to say and has a story to tell. And so there's, there's no shortage of people that I'd like to talk to, um, you know, uh, I'd like to talk to Gavin Newsom and I'd like to talk to Mario Cuomo. I did talk to Gavin Newsom as part of my time effort. But, you know, sometimes I really enjoy just talking to ordinary people who have done extraordinary things um, and who are not household names, but who deserve a platform, deserve attention and, and, and deserve to have their voices heard. And your voice is heard by and listened to uh, by so many. I don't and know about that. Never enough. Oh, yes. <laughs> Never enough. <laughs> well, and we mentioned uh, a really important topic uh, for today's conversation, and it is racism on uh, more than one occasion during, uh, during today's uh, uh, interview. What, in your opinion, uh, are effective ways to fight for a fairer and more just society? Well, that is a huge question, and but one that deserves careful consideration for many, many people. First of all, I think it has to be a collective, committed effort. I think that systemic racism is such a problem. I think the first thing we have to do is really educate ourselves. You know, I did a series of documentaries for National Geographic called America Inside Out, they came out in 2018. I'm so proud of these. Um, they're on Hulu if anybody's interested. And I think part of the problem is um, we haven't been truly educated about our history. Um, I did one episode on Confederate statues really explaining their, their um, you know, how they came about, why they came about, when they were erected, what they symbolize. Um, I told the story of Mitch Landrew. I was in Charlottesville for that horrible rally because I went to the University of Virginia and I was focused on the Robert E. Lee statue there. And, you know, I interviewed Brian Stevenson, who's one of my personal heroes from the Equal Justice uh, Initiative, and talked about, you know, really coming to terms with our past. And I think understanding how systemic racism affects every aspect of life. And, and really the historic roots of that racism. So I think that is honestly step one in a very, very um, intentional way. And then we just have to, you know, whether it's housing and neighborhoods and redlining or, uh, you know, which affects everything. It affects schools, it affects health in terms of your proximity to good grocery stores. You know, there's, it's so intertwined, I think. And so I think that, um, you know, we have to start coming together and coming up with real solutions. Uh, and I think that we have to just be mindful of our own implicit bias. And people have to work much harder at, at, at attracting people from all different backgrounds race, uh, also socioeconomic, because I think when you get different perspectives from different people, it only makes the workplace better and the end product more satisfying. So, you know, I know that we're trying to figure out how to have a more diverse workplace. And, 
You know, I've, I've tried to address many of these issues in my work because I feel like, again, I still have a bit of a bully pulpit. So I did one on white anxiety. I did a little town in the middle of, of Iowa called Storm Lake, where there is a majority minority population and has been for some time and how they're able to live together, to peacefully coexist. Um, because I think, I think it's, it, it makes life so much richer if you are able to have different people from different backgrounds. But changing demographics are threatening to a lot of people. By 1944, I mean, 2044, um, we're gonna have a minority, majority minority population in this country. And that makes people, some people, uncomfortable. And I think we just need to have many more open conversations. And I think you're seeing that all over the country. I also have incredible faith in young people because, you know, the millennials get a, a, a bad rap. You know, they're entitled. Everybody gets a prize for the soccer game. You know, we've made them feel too special, right? And they can't deal with disappointment or uh, you know, some of the setbacks in life. But I think one of the things is they have really addressed social injustice head on from a very early age. You know, it's changed so much since I was in school with LGBTQ groups in high schools with, you know, uh, you know, uh, organizations that will help support minority students. And I think they feel very passionately and their priorities are quite different than the priorities that existed for my generation, honestly. Uh, they seem less materialistic and they seem more idealistic. And so I, I really feel like they're going to in many ways lead the way. And I've learned a lot from my daughters about things. And I think there's such a thing as reverse mentoring. And you can actually learn from young people. You don't have to buy everything they're selling. <laughs> And sometimes they should listen to us, honestly, because they don't know it all, even though they think they know it all. But there's a lot that they can teach us, I think, if we have open minds and open hearts. So I have a lot of faith in them. And it's, it's very moving for me to see them really get involved and commit themselves to this issue. Yeah. Every parent can relate to reverse mentoring. Yeah. I, I think you're absolutely <laughs> right. And I couldn't agree more. I think our... Our children uh, are uh, way ahead on the topic. Uh, I do believe that they're going to bring the necessary change and it's gonna come out of their own conviction and belief and the conviction and belief that they have, uh, they're growing up with, you know, for, for just and uh, inclusive society. So I share, I share your optimism. Now, obviously you have overcome very many difficulties personally and professionally. And um, one of the uh, last questions for today relates to what was the most difficult event that you've ever had to cover as a journalist? Mm. Well, there have been many, sadly, because there have been a lot of tragedies. Uh, you know, when you think about the fact that I started working, my first job was in 1979 when I graduated from college. So you think about this 40 year span that has unfolded. There have been many, many sad stories, but uh, certainly 9-11 was, was really very, very difficult, stressful, because we were covering it in real time. And it was just so heartbreaking, particularly the aftermath of 9-11, when so many, so many people were desperately looking for their family members. That was really, really uh, difficult. Columbine was very difficult, and Sandy Hook as well. I've become a real advocate for, for better gun legislation. I do think it's public health crisis. I think the CDC, I think it just got refunded to study this as a public health crisis, if, it, although funding was taken away for a while. Um, you know, I have no problem with gun owners, but I think they, you know, we need to figure out ways to make gun ownership safer and uh, to try to keep guns away from people who are going to shoot up schools and kill six and seven year old children. I've gotten to know a lot of the parents from Sandy Hook, just heartbreaking. Um, 
So I would say probably stories about gun violence in schools and also in cities like Chicago um, and then 9-11. Uh, those were probably the most difficult stories for me to cover. These were memorable stories and very difficult ones to cover. But an interesting uh, question for someone in your position is, how do you as an experienced journalist, how do you get your information? How do you balance different approaches? Yeah. What's, your new, what's your new source? What do you rely upon? You're, it sounds like you're asking me a Sarah Palin question. Yeah, I, you know, I was, I, was watching, I was watching that interview again on the but YouTube. newspapers and magazines <laughs> have you read to establish your worldview and keep you like abreast of current events? Um, I, you know, I, I read a lot of things. Uh, I actually depend on newsletters a lot in the morning um, because I think they've in many ways replaced newspapers or newspapers have newsletters. So yeah. I like to read my newsletter, Wake Up Call. Please sign up, go to katiecurric.com and sign up. Um, so obviously I read that. Um, I, I like the Washington Post has several newsletters that I like, some on politics, some on health, some on, on more general news. I have to say the New York Times is my hometown paper, uh, although they've been, they've been struggling with objectivity versus advocacy in recent days and trying to, to figure that out. So there have been some lively discussions in their, their newsroom, I'm sure. Um, I like Politico. I like Axios. Um, I like NPR. I like The Atlantic. I like The New Yorker. So, um, and, and you know, sometimes I also, I'm more progressive uh, in terms of my own political leanings, but I also try to watch Fox because I know a lot of people are getting their news and information from Fox and I want to see that perspective and how that's being conveyed to viewers. Um, the Wall Street Journal I like too, and the editorial pages of the journal are more conservative. Um, so I really do try to get a whole potpourri, <laughs> a whole uh, you know, variety of, of news and news sources. And you know, I still, there's still not enough hours in the day for me to read everything. It's impossible. Of course, yeah. Well, Katie, thank you so much for joining us. It was really a pleasure to hear from you today. I wish you good luck. I wish you good health and I wish you lots of lots of success in the future. And please remember the invitation for you to come and visit us at the Cleveland Clinic stands and stays and stands open. So well, we look forward to, wel to welcoming you here to, here to Cleveland. Thank in, you in so much for Thank you so much for having me and to everyone who uh, participated in this. Thank you so much for being here as well. And as I said, I have so much admiration for the work you do at the Cleveland Clinic. Toby Cosgrove is a good family friend. He was the best man in my sister Emily's wedding to George Beller, uh, my sister who sadly passed away from pancreatic cancer. But Toby has been a great friend uh, of ours, and I'm so happy to be here and to participate. And thank you so much for inviting me. And I hope I didn't talk too much because I now I can't now I have a, a, a sore throat. <laughs> but don't worry, <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, thank you again, and my thanks uh, to all of you who have joined us today for our first virtual ideas for tomorrow. This virtual series continues with more great guests in coming weeks. On June 16th, we'll hear from Kevin Love of Cleveland Cavaliers basketball team, and he'll be followed by Steven Schwartzman, CEO and co-founder of Blackstone Group on June 23rd. Dr. David Feinberg, Vice President of Google Health will join us on July 28th. Brian Grazer, CEO and co-founder of Imagine Entertainment, will join us on August 18th. Judy Faulkner will be with us uh, on September 2nd. Judy Faulkner is the CEO and founder of Epic Systems and Tim Brown, executive chair of IDEO on September 21st. Don't miss the chance to hear these great speakers wherever you are on our virtual ideas for tomorrow. Thank you for joining us. I truly appreciate your support and have a great night.